Hello everyone, my name is John Lorna and I'm a family physician, family therapist and educator from the United Kingdom speaking to you from North Wales. It's wonderful to be giving this presentation today, even if only remotely. Um, I have been part of a team who've been teaching narrative practice in healthcare for around 25 years now and we've done so at courses and workshops to thousands of people all over the world including the United States, but until last year, we did everything live. When the pandemic hit us last March, we thought our work would come to a halt, um, but as things have turned out, nothing could have been further from the truth. We found ourselves being asked straight away to offer workshops and courses online. The Physiotherapy Pain Association in the United Kingdom, which is like the equivalent of the Pain Summit, allowed us to try out some taster sessions, and then commissioned, uh, they commissioned a six session online course, which we ran in the fall. Um, when Rajam Roos contacted me around September to warn me that the workshop and presentation she had asked me to do in San Diego might not happen, I immediately asked if we could do this online and I was delighted when she said yes. A team of us uh, recently de delivered a workshop which ran over six two-hour sessions in the middle of January for the Pain Summit and my presentation now is going to be a condensed version of some of the didactic teaching I did during that workshop. Obviously, it won't include any of the interactive work and intensive coaching and narrative practice that took up most of the workshop, but I do hope it will whet your appetite and perhaps encourage you to enroll on one of our future workshops. There will also be a live question and answer session with me during the weekend of the 19th to 21st of February. It's been an absolute pleasure working with Rajam and I'm truly grateful for all the work that she's done in pulling this together. I'm obviously disappointed that we can't be joining or be joining each other in person in California, but I'm thrilled at all the different opportunities that working online has created, most especially with bringing together participants from different countries, continents and time zones. I'm now going to try and bring up my presentation and talk through the slides, many of which I used during our workshops over the last few weeks. So here we are. Uh, that's our title slide. Conversations inviting change is in a sense self-explanatory, but it's the approach that our team takes to teaching and learning and applying narrative practice, narrative-based practice in healthcare. And it's what I'm going to be talking about today after an introduction about the whole field of narrative medicine and narrative-based practice. Um, but I thought, first of all, you might want to see where I'm speaking from in North Wales. The tiny white dot in the middle of there is our home in North Wales. Um, that's obviously taken in the summer. More recently, uh, our part of North Wales has been looking like that, and that's the view taken a couple of weekends ago from the hill opposite our house. And uh, uh, you can see Snowdonia about 25, 30 miles away, and Snowdon itself is the left hand, uh, one of those triangular peaks uh, almost in the middle of the picture. Um, so let me start by saying a little bit about why do we think narrative is so important? And I use narrative, um, uh, narrative and stories interchangeably. Some people use it in a slightly different tense, a different sense. Um, I use narrative and stories to mean the same thing. I prefer the word narrative because you can use it as a verb, narrating, she narrated, and so on, and it gives more sense of action and flow and negotiability and flexibility and evolution. And I'll be saying a little bit about that in a minute. Um, 
I want to talk about something called the narrative turn, which is a philosophical shift that has affected many different fields of learning um, in the last 50 or so years. It began in philosophy and psychology, spread to uh, the social sciences, sociology, anthropology, and so on, and really reached medicine in the later part of the of uh, the 20th century, around the turn of this century. Um, it was a move away from interpreting things in terms of predetermined frameworks, whether those were political frameworks like Marxism or psychological ones like psychoanalysis. It, it turned away from saying what is really going on here in our terms, and instead was asking the question, how are things being described here? How are people talking about their own realities rather than us trying to understand it in terms of our realities? How are they constructing their worlds? How are they constructing their worlds through the stories that they tell? Um, a central idea in this narrative turn was that we are all continually making meaning through telling stories. This is a universal uh, a cultural activity, a universal human activity. It seems to operate across all societies and throughout history. The idea that people tell, that they narrate what they have experienced, what they are experiencing, what they expect to experience. And as they narrate, they are creating meaning for themselves. They're not just describing it for other people. They are creating meaning in their own minds for their own use. And these stories are not static and they never exist in isolation. If I give an account of something to uh, somebody in my family and then I give an account to somebody else outside my family, it will obviously be different because of the different relationships that I have with them. It will also be different because having told it once, I will then be thinking about it and revising it in my own mind. And it will be a different story the next time I tell it. You can't put your foot in the same river twice. You can't tell the same story twice. These are altered by the telling. They're altered by the relationships that we have with the people that we're talking to, and obviously by differences in gender, age, background, and so on and so forth. The important thing from the point of view of healthcare is that every story contains its own momentum for change. Every story has a potential for evolution. And if we bear this in mind as healthcare practitioners, as health professionals, we can make a tremendous difference to the way that people tell their stories. And this is the crucial aspect for working professionals. Good listening and good questioning can facilitate positive change in the stories, but more by allowing space for this to happen rather than by trying to persuade or nudge the narrator, the storyteller. And I want to unpack this statement a little bit by saying a couple of things. The first thing is that where listening is, is more than just listening. Listening is an active act of curiosity, it's an active act of engagement, it's, it's more than witnessing, it, it's witnessing, but witnessing and applying curiosity through questions. Again, something I'm going to say quite a lot about uh, in a minute. And it's also changing a story does not depend on persuading people, it may not even depend on giving them advice or guidance, it may not even depend on explaining things, although there is a place for all those utterances in our communication, and it may not depend, it should not depend generally on nudging the narrator. It comes with genuine curiosity and no presuppositions uh, about where the story ought to go and where you actually want the story to go. A real curiosity about the, where the story might go if given enough space and enough challenge. Now, these ideas can be tremendously useful in healthcare. Uh, 
particularly when used in combination with other familiar frameworks. And here I'm thinking of things like evidence-based medicine and guidelines and regulations and uh, statutory obligations and all those things. And no doubt, as I've been talking about stories, you've been thinking about thinking, yes, but what about all these other things? How do we integrate them with the business of listening to stories, being curious about them and asking good questions? about them. So in many situations, if not most in healthcare, we need to find a balance between being good listeners, curious in the way that anthropologists, ethnographers are curious, but at the same time, bearing in mind our own professional duties, our expertise, and what all the world around us, including our colleagues, our teams, and indeed our patients and their families and carers, expect us to deliver. I now want to talk just a little bit about the emergence of narrative medicine, which, as I said earlier, really burgeoned around the year 2000. It had been bubbling up for 10 or 20 years before then, but 2000 was really the turning point because just before then and just after then, two very important books came out, one by two GP colleagues of mine in the United Kingdom, Trish Greenhouse and Brian Hurwitz, and uh, I contributed a chapter to that book on narrative in mental health. And then about four years later, Rita Sharon uh, from Columbia University in, in New York, who is a, 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 a physician, a professor of medicine at Columbia, she wrote this other crucial book, Narrative Medicine, Honoring the Stories of illness. And they really gave rise to an identifiable movement of narrative medicine, trying to look at the relationship between stories and medical care and medical practice. And the narrative medicine movement has uh, generated dozens of books since then and thousands of articles and has divided into many different activities. But collectively, these are the questions that we, we all ask. What kinds of stories do patients tell and why? Uh, patients tell different stories to their families, to their friends, to their next door neighbors and to healthcare professionals. Well, that's completely natural. We all tell stories in different ways to different people according to what we hope to do with those stories. Do we want to impress them? Do we want to elicit their sympathy? Or as often with healthcare professionals, um, do we want to influence them? Do we want to ask them for something and we want to slant our stories uh, in a way that will um, make them more inclined to do what we want? That, that's not manipulation, that is normal human storytelling. How do we tell, how do they tell their stories and why? And what kind of stories do health professionals tell and why? Because when we tell each other stories or when we tell patients stories, we also do it with a purpose. We have an intent there. We, we may want to portray ourselves as heroes. We may sometimes, when talking to colleagues, want to portray ourselves as victims. Uh, we may cast ourselves as detectives in a detective story with plot and suspense and an exciting outcome, or, or we may um, uh, pose as uh, wonderful scientists and, and so on and so forth. We we have stories with plots, we have stories with character, we have stories with the timeline, we have stories with suspense. These are part of innate human storytelling. And then another question, perhaps a more challenging one, how do medicine and healthcare themselves construct their stories? Because if you look at diagnoses or explanations of illness from, well, even from my own training a few decades ago, these are actually entirely different from how people give accounts of those illnesses now. And, and we would be deluding ourselves to think that those professional collective stories of our professions and healthcare as a whole 
do not change over time. We know they do. They also change uh, according to place and culture. What is understood by hypertension, for example, even here in the United Kingdom is quite different from how it is understood in, in, in Germany, uh, uh, only, only a thousand or so miles away. So how do we all construct these stories? Uh, what are the reasons and how do they evolve? How do they change? So that's an account of narrative medicine, and I want to focus more specifically now on narrative-based practice, the question of how do we take these abstract ideas and these uh, academic questions into everyday encounters, either encounters with patients and clients or the encounters we have with our trainees, with our colleagues when we manage them or teach them or work with them in teams. What, what do we do with these? How, how do we operationalize all these theoretical approaches? Well, you can sum it up with uh, this wonderful uh, expression that comes from the medical anthropologist Howard Brody, uh, who wrote a paper with, with this title, My Story is Broken, Can You Help Me Fix It? And he put forward the case that every patient comes to healthcare with a problem, a dilemma, an issue, but they also come with a story. And we not only need to address their problem, their symptoms with uh, a, a fix, a solution or a resolution, we also need to help them develop their story, develop their account of it. They, they, they need to be able to go home and explain to the people around them, I, I've got a new understanding of this. This is how I now describe what I have and this is how I can explain to you what I believe I should do or how I think I can manage it myself. So a different account, a different description, a different story is just as much a requirement as the actual prescription or treatment or whatever else we think is the right thing to do for that patient. Um, so that's narrative-based practice. I'm sorry I'm putting my slides in the wrong direction. Uh, uh, and this was really a pause for uh, an advertisement for uh, my own book. This is the edition, the second edition from a couple of years ago, uh, Narrative-Based Practice in Health and Social Care, which is really a textbook of how to apply these principles in the everyday uh, uh, healthcare encounter. As you can see, I've given it the, the subtitle, Conversations Inviting Change, which is the particular teaching approach I'll be talking about shortly. And Trish Greenhalgh, who wrote that original book about uh, narrative-based medicine, was kind enough to write the foreword. So let me move on now and say something specifically about integrating normative and narrative care. Now, what I mean by normative care is care that is governed by all the accepted norms that I was talking about earlier. These are the norms of current science, the norms of accepted evidence, the norms required by our professional codes of conduct, by our ethical codes, by statutes, by regulation, all those things. Those are the norms. So I call that normative care. And it has to be said that normative care is uh, both necessary, but, but also in very many cases, it is not enough. People need narrative care as well, I would argue, in the majority of cases. So how do we deliver the two at the same time and, and, and how do we operationalize that? Well, I like to illustrate it with a number of different pictures. Here's the first one. The chap on the left is digging a hole. He's trying to get to the bottom of things. And how often do patients say to us, we need to get to the bottom of this, or you need to get to the bottom of this? Um, and how often do we sit there and think, well, is this a thing? And does it have a bottom? Okay, it may be a thing. It may need a diagnosis. Uh, it may need an etiology to be discovered. It may need all sorts of bottoms. Um, but a lot of things don't seem like things. They seem more like stories. And then we wonder, is going downwards the right way 
to move. It's going downwards, the right orientation. Should we perhaps not be moving forward? Should we not be moving horizontally rather than vertically? And this is where the second picture comes in. This is a beautiful tapestry from Paris called The Lady and the Unicorn. And it shows the outcome that happens when you weave. Instead of digging, you weave. The patient puts in a thread, you put in the thread in the form of a curious question. They put in another thread, you put in another thread. And as you do so, something is created. Something is created that can be quite aesthetic and quite beautiful and surprises you at the end with something that is really quite different from the more or less blank piece of canvas with which you started the tapestry. And that's what I call by, what I mean by narrative care, moving from digging to weaving. Here's another illustration. This is the same thing in a sense, but applied to the Chinese or Japanese symbolism for yin and yang. How do you integrate storytelling with the norms? How do you do it in a way that it forms a harmonious whole, that the two seamlessly fit into each other and nourish each other? Here's a diagram I use a lot, and I've used this oh, probably in about 20 countries around the world, um, because everywhere has dumpling soup. And it's gone down especially well in Israel and in Japan, two countries where dumpling soup of quite different kinds uh, are, are part of the fabric of, of the national culture. And uh, the reason that dumpling soup is there, because the dumplings are the norms and the narrative is the soup. And if you don't have any dumplings, it isn't a dumpling soup. And if you don't have any soup, it isn't a dumpling soup either. So how do you make sure that every single encounter with a patient or every single encounter with a colleague has exactly the right mixture of science and norms and evidence as facts, but also the right mixture of fluidity, of potential for change, of potential for something very, very interesting and unusual to happen. Now, the way we teach conversations inviting change is nowadays almost entirely through peer supervision in small groups. We do a little bit of role play. We sometimes do video review. We do quite a lot of theoretical reading about narrative studies and anthropology and psychology and all kinds of background stuff. But the main thing that we teach through, the main medium we teach through is peer supervision in small groups, because this is what we believe. If you teach people narrative ideas and skills to offer supervision to each other, they will apply these to every aspect of their work in dialogue with patients and with each other. In other words, you orient, you reorient people towards a curiosity in each other's stories. And you do it through the medium of peer supervision so that you teach colleagues, you teach health professionals to be acutely attentive to their colleagues' stories, often stories of patients that they've seen, acutely attentive, acutely curious, and able to hold on to a faith that if you ask good enough curious questions, it will help the people who are telling those stories to reflect on what they're saying, to think about it from a different perspective, and to actually listen to their own stories evol evolving inside their own minds as they do so, and then tell them differently to themselves and to other people in the future. Here's a diagram that expresses that normative narrative tension or dialectic in the context of supervision. On the left, you have supervision as it is often conventionally understood, as somebody telling somebody else what to do, Some, somebody with superior knowledge or who thinks it's superior, telling somebody else what they should see and what they should do. And then on the right, you've got another form of supervision. You've got something which is super and visionary, and it excites people 
and people want it because it it, it gives them a feeling of growth and development and, and, and expansion and and it it, 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 it helps them uh, uh, broaden their own vision and and just as normative and narrative need to be woven together in every consultation so in supervision what you might call the performance the performance aspects of supervision and the pastoral care aspects of supervision need to be woven together you you could call the the left circle looking over somebody's shoulder and you could call the right hand circle looking after somebody and they need to go together in every supervision uh, conversation. Now, for the last part of my talk, I'm going to be talking about what we call the seven C's of conversations inviting change. And these these are they don't represent a do-it-yourself kit it's not like a guide to putting a piece of furniture together it's more like a mantra to hold in mind the central concepts and the core stance of taking a narrative approach or an integrative approach that brings normative and narrative together and we've chosen seven words beginning with c because they capture a whole lot of quite complex and sophisticated ideas but you you could choose eight p's or ten s's and indeed if you want to reframe a narrative stance in your your own words with 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 quite different letters beginning then that's absolutely fine but i'm going to go through these seven c's and explain the way that we teach them and again i'm going to use pictures because uh, often they appeal to people far more than just verbal explanations um so here is the first which is the c for conversations and this shows a whole variety of different conversations but what they all have in common is the level of attentiveness the level of curiosity one person listening to another questioning another a lot of the pictures people are smiling in order to engage and they all show conversations that are changing people's stories as as they tell them this is an act of creation these are not acts of description these are acts of creation and the second c is curiosity this is this is a delightful picture my wife and i have opposite sex twins who are somewhat older than these two and these are not our twins but it's one of the reasons i love this picture the other reason i love this is you can tell even from behind how attentive that they're being um and and fascinatingly uh, this is a special kind of attention it's an attention with also a degree of detachment in it they are deeply engaged in what they're watching but they're also looking through a hole in the wall and that gives them the slight distance that you need as what we sometimes call an observer participant you're looking you're listening but you're also processing your own mind what am i puzzled about here what am i curious about here what do i want to ask Ask that may make the person I'm observing think in a slightly different way or look at it from a different point of view. This is the next C and it's about contexts. When I'm talking to a patient, how, have they, how are they telling this story now and how might they have told it to somebody in the past? Who else have they talked to? Which other health professionals are they seeing? What, what do I know about their family? Who else in the family is involved in this problem, is concerned about it? So citing it within net, the networks that they, they, they work in and also thinking of your own networks. Who, who might I speak to about this? Who is around me? Who is in my team? What is my professional context? And what are the requirements bearing on me in this moment? So it's drawing the lens back to think about more than the two people just involved in the conversation. And the next C is complexity. If you think of any conversation between two people, let's say, as just a tiny fraction of the number of conversations that each of them are having with other people and that each of those other people are having with many, many other people. So I really add infinitum across arguably all, all, all the human beings 
on the planet so that any conversation we're having is a tiny microcosm, a, a snapshot, a small snapshot within a long uh, uh, and, and really endless video of thousands and hundreds of thousands of different conversations. And that gives us a certain humility and also a sense of perspective of how different all those other interconnected conversations might be. That this is really a, a fragment of the conversations in anybody's life and the fragments of the other the conversations that these are embedded in in their family and their society and their wider culture and here is the next c which is challenge and the idea that we need to take other people or help other people move just a little bit outside their comfort zone to move however far forward they're able to go on this occasion it may be a meter it may be a millimeter but to ask questions that invite them to think about something new um, and also we are asking ourselves questions that are, are challenging us about is there anything about this I don't know or I don't understand or is there anything here I might have prejudices about or is there anything that may constrain me for being as curious and attentive in this instance uh, as I might be. So challenge is a core part of conversations inviting change but set against that is caution. And here we have police dogs being immensely cautious about this cat so that he or she can walk with impunity past them. But isn't it interesting that at least one dog, a dog about halfway down the line, can't quite restrain themselves from looking as if they might pounce on the cat. And one or two dogs seem to have lost interest, including I think the third dog from the top. But some of the dogs have got that wonderful attentive expression. I'm thinking a dog about four up from the bottom of the line who has got his ears picked up and is wonderfully attentive, but still safe. Can we manage that kind of equilibrium, that equipoise within our conversations that we are both willing to invite people to explore new realities, but not insisting that they must, not pressurizing them, opening doors but not pushing them through it. Are we able to balance the challenge and the caution? And the last C is care because it underlies everything. It's our ethical stance, it should be our emotional stance. If you don't feel kind towards the person that you're dealing with, whether it's a patient of a colleague, something is wrong there and you need to address it and think what is going to restore me to a feeling of kindness towards this patient. Some people use the word compassion, but the, the key issue is how do you keep returning to a position of kindness from a position that may be one of inattention, it may be one of automatism, it may be one of boredom, it may be one of certainty. Oh yes, I know exactly what this person needs to do <clears throat> and I know exactly what I need to tell them. Any of those ethical or emotional positions lack sufficient kindness and we need to be able to return to the position of kindness and if necessary to get supervision ourselves to understand what it is about this person or the situation or indeed our own context that is at this moment impeding us from feeling enough kindness. So those are the seven C's, conversations, curiosity, context, complexity, challenge, caution, care. Uh, this has only, as I said, been a, a taster of what we teach. It hasn't included all the interactive work that we normally uh, have as part of our workshops and particularly the peer supervision, but I hope it has whetted your appetite uh, enough that you uh, may want to explore this further and hopefully will come to one of our workshops. Uh, we're doing more and more of these online as well as uh, hopefully before very long being able to return to doing these live in, in, uh, in other countries outside the United Kingdom. So thank you very much for engaging. Thank you very much for listening. I hope 
Um, it has been helpful in your work as healthcare practitioners. Um, if you want to find out more about any aspect of Conversations Inviting Change, uh, this website has got podcasts, videos, articles, links to books, and all kinds of information that will tell, uh, tell you more about Conversations Inviting Change, CIC, as we call it, and about narrative medicine and how to put that into practice. Uh, thank you very much, and I hope you enjoy all the other activities of the San Diego Pain Summit. And once again, I want to finish by thanking Rajan Roos for including me in this very exciting event.